and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, as I mentioned to some of you who are in earlier, I've got some fairly simple goals for the workshop today. SUNY has a tool or a rubric or a framework. I mean, they call it a, a rubric, but I think of it more as a, a framework that might be a, a useful set of things to keep in mind as we're planning um, planning courses for the fall. So um, let me just go ahead and jump right in. So my, my goals are basically to um, introduce you all to this Oscar rubric and to go through it in some detail to, to uh, show what, um, you know, what um, is there to help us think about our courses. Uh, we'll take a little bit of time to do a little bit of a scavenger hunt in the, in the framework. Uh, and you can all take a look and see maybe about uh, getting some ideas for your, uh, that you might want to think about for your fall courses from this framework. I do want to make sure that you all have the ability to get a, a copy of it um, because we're clearly not going to um, complete a whole course course planning um, process in the time we've got together this afternoon. And then I want to finish off by um, presenting another resource that SUNY uh, has put together, uh, which is a checklist for remote instruction, uh, which kind of takes the some of the features from the Oscar rubric and gives you uh, a series of things to, to walk through as, um, as we're all thinking about our, our courses for the fall. I assume that most of you are here because you're going to be teaching remotely. Um, I'm actually going to be teaching a fully online course, which is what the Oscar rubric was initially des developed for. Um, so my class won't actually have a, f a scheduled meeting time. All of the all of the key learning activities and assessments and the resources and so forth in, in my course will be um, will be asynchronous, although I will have some times when we can get together. Most of you will have a, a set time that's scheduled for your course, even if you're teaching remotely. And so one of the things you'll need to think about is how best to schedule activities for when you are together um, in your remote synchronous time and what activities you might want to do um, asynchronously outside of your, say, your Zoom yeah. sessions. Keith, if you want to make me co-host, uh, right. I can manage. Thank you. Uh, Okay. So um, let's just jump right in. I want to uh, pull up the Oscar rubric uh, here. Um, actually, let me copy into the chat a link to the notes we'll be using today. And uh, so, and, and when I follow up uh, for this meeting, I'll obviously send around the links to the Oscar rubric, the, the checklist uh, for remote instruction, these notes, uh, the link to the um, session recording and so forth. But anyway, um, uh, the Oscar rubric is, uh, initially it was the Open SUNY Course Quality Review rubric, which is uh, where we get Oscar, O-S-C-Q-R. Open SUNY has now become SUNY Online, but as far as I know, there's no, um, there's no uh, plans to change the Oscar rubric into, I guess, the, the soccer rubric, which is what the S-O-C-Q-R would be. Um, it's just available at oscar.suny.edu. And um, oh, actually, let me stop sharing and share again and select share computer sound because there's a short little introductory video that um, the SUNY folks have put together 
and it's here under the about Oscar um, page. And I think it's possibly worthwhile uh, playing through this. So. Open SUNY has developed an online course design rubric and process that addresses both the instructional design and accessibility of an online course that is openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt. The aim of the Open SUNY Course Quality Review, Oscar, rubric and process is to support continuous improvements to the quality and accessibility of online courses, while also providing a systematic approach to collect data across campuses, institutions, departments, and programs that can be used to inform faculty development and support large-scale online course design, review, and refresh efforts consistently. There are two components, the OSCAR process and the OSCAR rubric. The OSCAR process provides a framework and a dashboard to support a campus-tailored and scalable approach to improving the instructional design and accessibility of online or blended courses. There are three parts to the process. The online course review, using the OSCAR rubric, yields an action plan that informs the online course refresh process by targeting areas for improvements. After the identified areas have been refreshed and implemented, the learning review closes the continuous improvement loop to confirm the success of the changes made and the development of a plan for the next set of improvements. The dashboard is housed in Google Drive, which allows for free storage and collaboration. It automates campus-level course review efforts and accommodates custom rubrics by managing all the rubrics for the institution. Built-in analytics track course review progress and can be used to identify online course design trends. Working with multi-institutional teams of SUNY online instructional designers, librarians, distance learning directors, and technologists, Open SUNY staff started with the Chico rubric. 20 years of SUNY Learning Network research informed best online practices. The SUNY Office of General Counsel's Memorandum on Accessibility Considerations, Universal Learning Design Principles, and conducted a gap analysis with Quality Matters, iNicol, and Blackboard Exemplary Courses. The result Resulting 50 standards in the rubric target online instructional design and incorporate the community of inquiry model. The seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education, the adult learner, Bloom's taxonomy, how people learn, and has been mapped to the open SUNY fundamental and core competencies for online course design. The rubric is easy to use, flexible, non-evaluative, requires no storage space, can be customized, and can be implemented in a variety of ways. As part of an online faculty development and online course design professional development process, as an online faculty self-assessment, as part of an online course quality review process by online instructional designers, as a faculty peer review process, in a multidisciplinary collaborative team review model, the rubric also produces an action plan, allows for prioritization of standards, estimates amount of time to make improvements, offers suggestions and examples for improvements, accommodates modification and addition of standards. The 50 Oscar rubric standards also integrate specific ways to make an online course accessible to students with disabilities. Oscar was adopted by the Online Learning Consortium in 2016 and is featured as the online course quality rubric in their suite of online quality scorecards. The Open SUNY Oscar rubric is flexible, customizable, research-based, openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt, and nationally recognized. It is currently being used by 56 SUNY institutions and hundreds of non-SUNY institutions and individuals. For more information on Open SUNY and OSCAR, visit OSCAR.org. That's O-S-C-Q-R dot org. Keith, you're muted. Thank you. I, so uh, that was perhaps uh, somewhat uh, corporate uh, speak, but there were a few things that I do want to uh, to pull out from there. So this this rubric uh, or framework um, has been under development for a number of years. It's uh, used extensively across SUNY, and um, 
although we aren't using it in a kind of institutional quality review kind of format, uh, I, there is a, a nice focus on how faculty can use it to kind of self-assess how they're uh, planning um, uh, what's going on, you know, what, they're, what they're planning for their courses. And I think it's just a nice uh, framework, as we'll see in a minute, uh, that puts in one place the kinds of things you'll want to think about as you're thinking about how to do your remote uh, instruction course this fall. Uh, also, um, it does draw on a number of the frameworks that we've used at Purchase for a long time to help faculty think about developing courses, whether they're online or face-to-face -face or blended courses. There is um, this um, community of inquiry model that I'll just pull up quickly. As you are thinking about um, how you're going to des design, plan your remote course for the fall, how you are going to run it. Um, there are a couple of things you want to think about. Uh, one is certainly how you can make sure that your presence as the instructor is um, faithfully comes across in, in the online tools that you've got available to you. I mean, it's one thing to teach our classes face to face in the in the classroom. It's a, a little bit different, as we most of us saw last spring when we we're pivoting to the remote instruction. So, you know how to how to make sure that you have a strong presence in your online classroom or remote classroom, but also how can we make sure that all of our students who are are in there with us can be we can be sure that they're engaged that they have an opportunity to express themselves and make feel like they're uh, joining a community of learners um, and and make sure that all this comes together so that you know students can interact with the course content interact with you interact with each other in order to kind of construct their un understanding or construct meaning around what we're covering in the course. So that's, that's an important framework and we'll see it um, showing up in the, in the Oscar rubric. Uh, I've, I like to use this seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education. Uh, and uh, there are lots of places where you can find the original uh, document by um, um, by uh, Pickering and, and, and Gamson, um, but uh, basically, you know, in thinking about what makes good education for undergraduates, um, this classic paper talks about encouraging uh, contact between students and faculty, developing relationships among students, and, you know, that's certainly important for many of our face-to-face -face classes, and how do we make sure we, we encourage that in our remote classes, encourage active learning, giving prompt feedback, emphasizing time on task, communicating high expectations, and allowing students to show in multiple different ways that they are, are learning the material. So that's another important framework. And then finally, if, um, you know, if you're not familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, um, there are actually several Bloom's taxonomies, but the one that um, most people talk about is this uh, Bloom's taxonomy for uh, you know, cognitive um, Uh, cognitive learning where there are lower order and higher order thinking skills and um, the some of the items in the Oscar rubric and some of our aspects of how we plan our courses will help make sure that we've got an appropriate balance of lower order and higher order thinking skills and and that they are you know mapped appropriately across what the outcomes we want for our courses, uh, how we're going to assess students, what kind of learning activities they're going to do, uh, and so forth. So, um, 
with that as a background, uh, I think at this point, I just want to jump in to um, the Oscar rubric a little bit more. Um, so again, it's at oscar.suny.edu. And um, there are, as was mentioned in the video, <coughs> 50 of these standards that are part of the framework. And I guess the first thing I want to um, to emphasize is don't get strung out or, or overwhelmed by the fact that there are 50 of these. Um, as, uh, as we'll see, there are maybe some of these uh, standards that are gonna be more important to you as you think about planning your course. And when we finish off with the checklist for remote instruction, it might also have provide a little bit of a framework for thinking about this. So um, I think what I, what I want to do is just pull up uh, one of the standards to show you what is available in, in each of these and then just go at a high level over um, the different areas that um, the framework provides um, some things for you to think about. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the, the first standard, which is getting started. So each of the standards will have some um, kind of background description of what we're talking about with the standard. So as you are, as we're all developing our courses for the fall, and we're going to be in many cases uh, teaching remotely, and we're not going to have a chance to meet our students face to face at the beginning of the semester before we pivot to remote like we did last spring. Uh, we're going to have to do, plan a course that makes it clear that, you know, um, there is a welcome and, and getting started materials built into the course so that students don't get lost, um, you know, from day one. So there will be a, uh, a little bit of a background. All of the standards will have a short video clip. The getting started content is important because you want the student to know what they need to do as soon as they enter the course for the first time. Uh, what you don't want to have happen is a student who feels lost or they feel confused by you know what they're supposed to do when they first enter the course. So it's always important um, for their first impression to be um, clear and to be uh, I guess specific as far as what they need to do next. Uh, to start to get into the content of the course. So what we've um, implemented at MCC is uh, a recommendation to have them uh, have an intro video and also some quick, easy steps underneath that video. So the first thing they see is a face, they hear a voice, they are instructed and kind of welcomed uh, to the course. And then that's followed by here's some easy next steps to get you started. So again, for us at MCC, it's part of a template that we're working on where students um, can have a similar experience from course to course so they also know what to expect you know across courses and again that's i click on the course for the first time i have a quick message from my instructor and then some next steps on what to do in the course a potential pitfall for a welcome um, and getting started section i guess it could be over complicated um, that would be so yeah, I mean, you get the idea that uh, each of these standards will have a short little video descri discussion, description of what's going on in the standard. Um, these little uh, short videos might be from faculty who have experience teaching online or remotely, or they might be from designers who are helping, who have you know, uh, spent a lot of time helping faculty to develop courses. And I, I, I like the, um, the idea that was put forward in this little video here of uh, 
you know, starting out your course, maybe just right at the top of your Moodle course, uh, embedding a short little video from you welcoming your students to the class and, and letting them know that we're going to, you know, be getting started with the remote uh, in, uh, course here and having some materials right below that that make it easy for the students to, to get going on the course. Um, you know, you can talk about the role of your synchronous sessions, how you're going to be meeting in Zoom, um, what role you're going to play for activities that are taking place in Moodle, and you know, just give the students a, a, a quick orientation to you and to how the course is going to work. So standard will have this, this um, kind of background information. It'll have a short little explanatory video. There are um, regularly, well, all the standards will have a uh, fairly concise list of bullet points about ways that you can think about applying this standard as you're thinking about developing your course for the fall. And then there will be, um, you know, links out to other resources. Uh, University of Central Florida here, for example, with their teaching online pedagogical repository has just a ton of resources that can be of uh, benefit as we're planning our remote and online courses. Uh, links to related resources and most of the standards will also have links to references that provide some of the research background for uh, for the standard um, that uh, that's been developed so as you look through these standards um, you know from one standard to the next you'll you'll see that basic structure time and time again so what I want to do is uh, maybe take five or so minutes just to give a very high level overview to these 50 standards. We're clearly not going to go through all 50 standards in detail in, in the workshop here, nor would you necessarily want to or need to as you're uh, planning how you're going to put together your course for the fall. But it, um, you know, it's worth taking a look at, at these overall um, uh, areas that the standards are grouped into, and then, um, and then I'll stop screen sharing, and we'll take some time to give you all time to poke around um, at the at the Oscar rubric and and try to see what uh, what elements there might be um, of interest to you this afternoon. So. Uh, again, if we're at the, um, at the Oscar site, this main menu across the top gives you a nice, uh, easy way to get to all of the standards. The uh, first category of standards are all about providing an overview and basic information uh, to your students. Because again, as, 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 uh, as I've mentioned, we're going to be dealing with a situation where, for many of our classes, um, we won't be necessarily meeting with them. Um, well, I mean, perhaps your first meeting with them will be your first Zoom session, but the more you can set up your Moodle course space to uh, provide uh, students this kind of um, overview to the course, the less lost that they're going to be as they also are dealing with uh, taking a lot of courses remotely that they weren't planning to take remotely. So we looked at standard one, getting started. Uh, you know, uh, standard two talks about providing an, an overview. A number of these are fairly straightforward kinds of things. You want to make sure that you can point students to campus policies. Um, obviously, you would normally put that in your syllabus. Um, if you're not meeting with your students to physically hand out a syllabus, you can certainly post or, or create uh, resources in your Moodle course that you know, provide that, um, that syllabus information. But it's also a good idea just to you know, put up a PDF of, or a Word document of your syllabus so that students can actually print out and have a hard copy. Um, 
it will be increasingly important for our students this fall that they're plugged into uh, the resources that will help them be successful. And so, you know, even though many of our students aren't going to be on campus, they're still going to have access to the counseling center. They're still going to have access to the, um, the learning center. Um, even though the learning center is undergoing some uh, revisions, the, the writing center, all of these um, different uh, student support services, it, it will be increasingly important for us to uh, make sure that we, in our courses, are, are connecting students up with those resources. I guess I will mention one thing here. Um, student Services has contracted a new uh, online tutoring platform called Thinking Storm and um, this last month we integrated it into Moodle so it is a, a resource that um, an activity actually that you can add to your Moodle uh, course space to make it easy for your students to uh, sign into that um, tutoring platform if they need to get help. Um, Obviously, providing course objectives, that's, that's clearly important for your students. Uh, okay, so for the next section, deals with a number of things you can think about as you're thinking about the tools that you're gonna be using to meet with your students remotely or or put up learning activities for your students in Moodle. And again, we won't go through these in detail, but um, basically I think of this category as things to think about to make sure that the technology that we all have to use in order to mediate our courses this fall are not a barrier to our students. And I know many of us had experiences this last spring where a number of our students did have technology barriers. Um, and so as we're planning our courses for the fall, uh, maybe we, we need to um, think about how we're using tools to, um, to reduce the probability of that happening. So the standard 11 is about whether or not the students have the requisite skills to use the tools that um, you are making use of in your course, that you um, are scaffolding um, experiences for the students so that they can become effective users of the technology you're using, that they have access to it, and that the technology is accessible. And um, you know, we've spent a lot of effort over the last few years to make sure that the technology that we are providing on campus meets accessibility standards. Um, you know, for example, Moodle as a platform is accessible. The content we put into Moodle may or may not be accessible. So that's really kind of our responsibility as faculty uh, with help from uh, support staff. But, um, you know, those accessibility issues, we want to make sure, and I think not only accessibility, but also maybe equitability, uh, equity issues as well. Uh, we know that some of our students don't have the same access to technology as others. So some of these standards would be maybe of interest for you to poke around later um, as we've got, if you've got more time. Um, Design and layout, there are a lot of standards here and many of them are fairly, um, what's a nice way of saying it? They're very, um, very specific and very focused on um, accessible design and good design principles. Um, you know, don't use a lot of blinking text or any at all. Make sure you've got, um, formatting and colors, schemes, and so forth that don't provide a barrier for any of our, any of your students to access uh, the, the, the materials that you put up in your course. So a lot of these are, are pretty straightforward and, and very specific. Um, standard 16 here talks about making sure that as you are putting materials up, 
in say Moodle, if you're putting up learning materials and, and activities uh, that um, students are clear about how they need to navigate through your course. Now with Moodle, we've got an advantage in that the default page layout for a Moodle course makes it fairly straightforward that what the activities and resources we're putting up in our Moodle courses kind of just maps out and follows um, the course of the semester, whether you've laid it out in terms of weekly sections or, um, or if you use topics to mirror the different uh, units or modules that you have in your course. Um, We've, we've got a fairly easy navigation uh, in Moodle for our students. Um, in terms of content and activities, uh, I, before I, I make some general comments here, I would just make the point that um, as we're thinking about planning our courses for the fall, it's always useful to think about our courses from what we like to call a backwards course design. So if we start out with what we want our students to accomplish, what the learning outcomes of the course are, then that will inform us, well, what really are the needed assessments that um, students, that, that students have to do in order for me to know whether or not they're meeting those course outcomes. Then, you know, what learning out activities do I need to provide to the students so that they're prepared to be successful on those assessments? And only finally, um, you know, what, what content, what resources, what learning materials do the students need in order to be able to work through those activities? I know when I started out as a young faculty member uh, too, many, too many decades ago, uh, I, my course design process was basically, okay, well, I'm teaching um, introductory zoology. What's the text I'm going to be using? What are the chapters in that text? How can I develop lectures to um, engage students with those um, chapters from the text? And only at the end did I think about, well, okay, how am I going to test students to know if they've learned anything? Um, you know, if we approach it from that backwards course design, it makes it a lot easier to jettison things that we don't need. And if you're, you know, developing a remote or an online course, uh, the more you can focus in on what are the assessments, learning activities, and then resources that map directly to what I might want my students to accomplish, makes it easier to give up things that, um, that don't necessarily have to be in there and, and streamlines the course for you and for your students. But just a, a couple of things in here, um, you know, uh, higher order thinking. Um, if you're doing a foundational course, it's uh, okay for most of the um, outcomes and uh, assessments to be focused at lower order thinking skills. But if you're doing a, um, you know, an upper level course where uh, the focus is on higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, where you're asking your students to synthesize and analyze, you know, analyze uh, theoretical frameworks and apply those to the materials that they're covering in class, then you want to make sure you've got an appropriate balance of higher order and lower order thinking skills represented in the learning activities and the assessments and the learning outcomes. Um, authentic activities. Um, this is perhaps a, a standard worth looking at in, in more detail. How can we ensure that, I mean, for example, if, if I were teaching an upper level course where the learning outcomes are for um, 
for students to do that um, analytical and synthetic materials. And then the activities I'm having them focus on are memorization of content and multiple choice exams as assessments. I've got a real disconnect between you know, the outcomes of the course and what activities that I'm having them do. And I would really not say that, you know, that, that memorization activity, that multiple choice exam, wouldn't really meet the criteria of being an authentic activity, authentic assessment. Um, again, some more accessibility things. Um, your courses may or may not use educa open educational resources. That is another um, priority for SUNY as a whole and for the, for the college, given the impact that OER materials have on um, student um, success. But uh, I mean, if, if you are interested in how you might find some openly licensed materials for your course, uh, you know, contact us or contact your, your librarian. Um, these standards on interaction, I think, are, are pretty important. Uh, you know, they're certainly at a different level than some of these, you know, don't use blinking text kind of things. Um, and really highlight what we were talking about before with that community of inquiry framework where you want you want instructor presence in the course you want um, you know how, how can you ensure effective feedback to your students when you're teaching them remotely and going back to those seven principles of good practice how um, how can you encourage peer interactions that you know students students interacting with each other as well as with you and with the course materials, how to develop a sense of community and so forth. And then finally, um, there are standards that uh, talk about how um, you might think about um, providing feedback, uh, assessing student performance. What does that mean in an online or remote class compared to how I would have done it in a face-to-face -face class? So at this point, I think I'm, I'm going to stop sharing a little bit because, um, you know, screen sharing always uh, seems so isolating. Um, but I do want to you all to take a few minutes to make sure you are um, in the core in the Oscar rubric and looking around. So I'm going to put the link into the link to the Oscar rubric into the chat again. I want you all to take maybe five minutes to go to the Oscar rubric. Um, again, um, go to that section where you've got the pull down menu that gives you access to the different standards. Just pick one of those standards that, um, that even just this afternoon interests you for some reason. Skim through the standard, maybe take the time to, to play the little video, but I think, um, if you especially look at the bullets for ideas about how you can use that standard to apply to your course, um, if we take like five minutes for everyone to do that, and then uh, I'd like people to come back and start typing to the chat some of the ideas that just came up about what you might think about for your course based on the standard you looked at. So at this point, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop babbling. Um, I'll see if there are um, any questions? I see Lenka put a question in the chat. Um, the um, uh, I may have a short workshop coming up on the online tutoring, but basically, Lenka, if you just add the Thinking Storm activity from uh, in, into your Moodle course, that will provide your students a link to the tutoring services. So you just have to go add an activity or resource select Thinking Storm, give it a title on your course page, like, uh, you know, link to tutoring services and hit save. And that's, uh, that's sufficient to provide your students access to the tutoring.
So Ando, um, I mean, the standards, there are 50 standards there. They're organized into those categories. Uh, I doubt any of us will take into account all 50 of them as we're planning our fall courses. I mean, if we were doing full-blown online course development and reviews and, and we had a situation where, you know, we had maybe an instructional designer working with you um, in developing your online course, we probably would look at all of them. But... I'm pitching the Oscar rubric more as a self-reflection, a self-assessment tool. So, um, I, mean, I just want to make sure everyone is comfortable going to the Oscar rubric and, and has the ability to poke around in those tools, in, in those standards. And then I think the you, more, most useful thing is the kinds of thoughts that thinking about these standards uh, will generate in in how we think about our courses in the fall. And, you know, if looking at four of those standards gives you some insight as to how you want to plan your course for the fall, then you look at those four standards. Yeah, so Maria, you were a little bit uh, creative in the past uh, with putting lots of stuff into your Moodle course. Yeah, I mean, my, my, some of my students kind of like it. I, I do a lot with pictures or, or use, you know, try to match a color with a topic. But I have heard more recently from students who say they're overwhelmed or they, like I realized that I have to just do better with understanding visual communications. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm linking here, Keith, uh, this because it reminded me from the SUNY uh, remote thing. Um, that that I just put in is a link to the, the uh, syllabus template that follows OSTQR. Is that what I'm saying right? Yeah. That I thought was kind of useful. Um, uh, I'm getting a you need access if I try to follow that link. Maria. Oh, okay. So I have to try to find another way. Probably from my, it's probably in my Google Drive. Okay. Sorry. I mean, uh, one thing I want to do, uh, you know, we'll spend a couple more time on this, a couple more minutes on the scavenger hunt kind of activity, but um, I do want to show you all how you can get uh, uh, the Oscar rubric in a couple of different formats that you, uh, that you can use for your uh, for yourself, um, reflection on your on your courses, but then I want to finish off with a uh, checklist for remote instruction that the SUNY folks have put together. Um, yeah, these are great ideas about getting to know the instructor and so forth. Um, that kind of refers to the Oscar rubric, but also maybe simplifies the the process a little bit and gets you away from thinking about oh oh dear I've got. 50 standards that I need to be thinking about. So um, let me pick back up then. And um, I mean, people can continue to put uh, stuff into the chat. No, I still need access on that. But maybe it's the same thing I'm going to be showing in a, in a minute, uh, Maria. So also at the um, uh, at the Oscar site is. Um, 
this option to get Oscar. And uh, I'll just maybe point you to a couple of links here. You can download this Oscar. I mean, you could just go to the Oscar site and say, OK, I'm going to look at each of these standards in turn and pick out the ones that um, that I'm interested in. So I'm go here to standard nine to see what it says about course objectives. And then I'll you know read through here and I'll I'll use that to help think about how I'm going to be presenting my course outcomes to my students and how I'm going to make sure that all of the activities that I'm having them do, they, they know how they tie back to the outcomes for the course so that even though they are remote and we're not meeting face to face all the time, um, students feel like they know what they're doing and why, you know, whatever. Um, but if you go to Get Oscar, you can download a PDF and um, this is actually downloaded from the Online Learning Consortium site. So you would actually have to take the time to um, um, to uh, you know, give them some basic. They they want to know who is you know, making use of the Oscar rubric, so they have you provide a little bit of information before you can download the scorecard. But if you download it as a PDF. It will basically just, and let me, let me bring this up a little bit. Um, it will list all of the, the standards. And then you can take a look at your course and say, ah, does my course as it stand now um, include a welcome and getting started content? Um, yeah, I, I think that's in pretty good shape. Does it have an orientation? Well, maybe that needs a little bit of work and you can make some notes for yourself about, you know, what you want to, to work on. And again, you don't have to necessarily go through all 50 standards here. Um, but this gives you a nice little quick checklist of, uh, oh, I haven't done much work at all on this aspect. And, um, you know, that would be a major, you know, revision for me to, you know, to deal with some of the issues here. Well, maybe given what other things I've got to work on, I'm just going to, you know, live with it the way it is because I've got times when I'm meeting face to face or, or when I'm meeting in Zoom with my students. So this course doesn't have to be fully standalone. But anyway, the, that PDF uh, format is, is useful. Um, there is uh, also this link to generate a, uh, a Google Doc format. And again, if you click on that, it's a short little form that goes to uh, SUNY Online, and you just fill it out with your email address and the name of your course, and they will automatically generate a Google Doc for you that um, you know has a has a tab where you can put in some basic uh, information, gives you a place as a faculty member where you can basically do in this Google Doc what. Um, what I just uh, showed as um, you know in the in the PDF, but you know if you want uh, to get some feedback from a faculty colleague or from one of us or from your um, from your library liaison or from one of us in the TLTC, you could take this Google Doc and share it with you know whoever you want to get feedback and. Also provide them access to what you're developing in your course, and this would be a framework where you could actually get, um, you know, some peer review as well as using it for your own reflection on um, what you want to plan for your course. So, um, so that's there. There are some tutorials as well for. Um, how you would uh, could use these uh, Oscar forms for your either for your self reflection or for peer review. 
I just want to finish off in the time we've got left, and uh, this sh we should finish in plenty of time today uh, by pointing to this checklist for remote teaching. That just again gives you some of the ideas you might want to think about when you are planning your remote course for the fall. And, and um, some of the OSCAR standards that are relevant to the different, uh, different steps here. And you can use this as a checklist, or you can just use it again as a framework for some of the things you might want to think about for your course. Uh, I like that it starts out here, you know, first thing you want to do is contact your students. Uh, Maslow is before Bloom. So before, before you even think about lower order versus higher order thinking skills, you want to make sure that your students are welcome and they're comfortable and um, you know they they feel like they are joining uh, a community of learners even even when you are um, remote and so you know this email could be a uh, Moodle course announcement that will go out to their email you can in in the time we've got, we won't go through all of these in detail, but um, you can go through these different checklist steps as you are thinking about putting your course together for the fall and uh, for example review the syllabus just gives you a number of things you might want to consider uh, again these are questions more so to jog your ideas about um, about thinking about your course um, but again, this, uh, you know, how do you facilitate interaction between the students? How do you um, um, present content in a way that they're going to engage with? How are you going to provide feedback and so forth? Each one of these, um, I mean, this revise your syllabus. I, I like this because, no, not that one. I guess it was review your syllabus. You know, start with the end in mind, as we talked about. Um, what do you want your students to accomplish as they are um, taking your course remotely? Uh, and then what are the key things that you need to put together in terms of learning activities and assessments to make sure that they can, can meet those ends? Um, learning activities, again, you can go through uh, each of these checklist pages in turn, they uh, reference different standards from OSCAR and uh, also have um, most of the pages have lots of uh, related resources. Some of these are SUNY pages, others are um, external uh, resources that um, the developers at SUNY have come across and, and have found useful when they're working with their faculty. If you are um, teaching a lab course, you know, what are some resources for uh, how you can adapt a lab to a remote or online kind of um, situation? Um, how uh, how would you adapt a lecture-based course? How would you adapt a discussion-based course? These resources, I think, are all from UMSL. Um, so, I mean, they make very nice, uh, nice resources to look through. One of the things we're all going to have to think about as we're teaching remotely is, and is kind of some of the topics we covered in, if you were at the uh, What's My Blend workshop, you know, what is our going to be our balance between synchronous interaction with our students and asynchronous? Um, and, you know, if we rely just solely on our synchronous Zoom sessions with our students, um, what are going to be the limitations of that? What are the advantages of that? How can we add asynchronous learning activities in Moodle to what we're doing in Zoom to, um, you know, complement each other and to provide a mix that will give students flexibility and reduce some of the technology demands on the part of our students. 
but still have you know enough synchronous meeting so that we have a sense of community. Um, so I would you know point you all to this this checklist. The the pages have all have very insightful questions for you to mull over as you are thinking about how you're going to put your course together, as well as these links out to um, to different resources. So at that point, I'm going to stop sharing and um, see if uh, you know what people's thoughts are, what questions you might have, and um, and how. Um, how these resources might help you think about your courses for the fall. I think that these, uh, all of these different guidelines are extremely helpful but I also find myself a little bit overwhelmed yep. <laughs> the sheer number and right. all the places to click through. And so it's having a sort of meta lesson for me in terms of how uh, communicating with our students who are being asked to have all these really different formats of classes using different technology. And so uh, some uh, bearing in mind the most parsimonious, let's say, right. way of meeting my my course's goals um, for the sake of students. Right. So I'd say, you know, what, what do you, um, I mean, the fact that most of us have a scheduled class time is an advantage, right? And so, um, what what do we want to do in those scheduled Zoom times that will make most use of those? And then what might be things um, that can be moved out, out of that? I know that some faculty, um, you know, if their face-to-face -face class was a, th a three and a half hour long evening class, you know, you don't necessarily want to do a three and a half hour long Zoom session once a week. And so, you know, again, what's what's the balance and how can these different um, tools? So there's a lot to click through. Um, I guess I would suggest that, um, you know, if you've got, some ideas about how you're thinking about your class that you want to run by someone. You know, clearly, um, we can schedule individual consultations rather than this kind of workshop format. Um, I think you know, keeping it simple is um, probably the best idea, and so. If your students know that, well, we're going to make use of our Zoom session time to do class discussions and, you know, other kinds of interactive uh, um, activities. And for our class, um, the times when I need to do lectures, I'm going to put them up either as, um, you know, embedded YouTube videos or voice thread lectures um, and that uh, we're going to turn in some activities in Moodle. It's, it's possible, it's, it's, it's um, it re readily doable to you know, make sure that you've got a fairly small suite of tools that you're using uh, for, for interacting with your students and making sure that they're doing the learning activities and the assessments that you need for them to accomplish what they need to accomplish in the course. Yeah, Dora. Thanks, Keith, for this session. I just was thinking about trying to get to know students that we've never met before. That right. That concerns me a lot, the community, you know, I like the ideas of the icebreakers and things like that. Yeah. I'm wondering your thoughts and others' thoughts about um, like keeping video cameras on. Um, I know that we can't really require 
students to keep their cameras on, but I think it's really hard when we can't see a face. Right. Could we give like participation points for keeping your camera on the whole time or like very low stakes, just like a couple points a class if you keep your camera on? You certainly can do that. I mean, um, you'd want to spell that out in the syllabus, right? This is a this is an expect. We are going to have synchronous class time in Zoom. We're going to have asynchronous learning activities in Moodle. For us to make the synchronous class time in Zoom most effective, we need even there to have make sure that we have a community of learners, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're all hiding behind your camera off, then we don't have that. And so, yes, uh, you're going to get some participation points for, for being there uh, more fully than if you're, I mean, you're more, you're more fully there if you've got your video camera on than if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, you're going to have to monitor that some way if, if you're going to assign points to it. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, if if someone turns their camera off for three minutes in order to deal with something uh, like a, a childcare issue in the in the in the in the room, what does that mean? Does that count against or not? You know, the, they're just decisions that you, as instructor of record of the course, you know, um, will will want to make or. Um, involve your students in coming up with, uh, you know, what is our etiquette for our Zoom meetings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kristen? Yeah, I found, I found in my, um, when I transitioned to online this spring that I just sort of, and I do this in, in my in-person classes too, but I sort of had a community agreement conversation. Yeah. And I also was really transparent about, um, how as a teacher, it's so much harder to re uh, receive feedback over uh, Zoom or over the online. So I was just very transparent. It's like, if I can't hear or if I can't under, you know, it's just ways for me to help understand how you're doing. Um, and so I just tried to be really honest and I found that that was helpful and encouraged the students to leave their cameras on. Right. And, and if you, if we're talking about the zoom sessions in particular, you know, obviously you've got multiple channels of communication. So, uh, the question is to what extent do you want to have the chat window on zoom be a, an ongoing communication source? And if, if you do want that, then it's good practice to each week or each session, you know, maybe assign a different student to be the chat monitor. Because you, if you are running, if you're running the, the Zoom part, you're sharing your screen or you're not, or you're trying to facilitate a discussion by looking at the gallery window, um, then it's difficult to, for you to manage to monitor the chat at the same time. So assigning that role to a student who can have the ability to break in every now and then and say, oh, you know, there's been an interesting point that was made in the chat. Maybe uh, let me, let me uh, bring that out and then you can, you can respond to it or you can have the class respond to it. Um, I mean, there are also the, you know, the hand raising, the yes, no, nonverbal feedback tools in Zoom that um, you can use to uh, facilitate um, some amount of conversation. But anyway, uh, you know, any, any ideas about your course plans for the fall that you want some feedback on, you know, certainly contact us at the TLTC. We can... Um, we can provide some feedback. Rosanna? Oh, you're, you're muted still. There. Uh, well, I am, I feel that I am a tiny bit different than anybody else yes. because it's dense. In a conservatory, you're dense. And uh, I found that uh, when I was in Zoom last fall, last spring, uh, it was incredibly hard to maintain, uh, this happened in the spring, to maintain 
a creativity, uh, interaction, a sense of community, collaboration, right. because I couldn't control the students. They were, some of them were in Timbuktu, some, some of them were in California, some of them were in Japan. So, you know, all this wonderful, uh, uh, you know, information that you, you have given me, I'm not quite sure right. they're useful. And, and I don't know where to go. I mean, I, I do it instinctively. I have to um, tell you, let me finish. I, we are going back to, hopefully, we are going back to the conservatory to teach mm -hmm. personally. But my feelings are that something is going to happen. I'll be honest with you. Because yeah. I don't think that the student, I don't think that the student are going to unsocialize themselves and spend, you know, the evening, the night in the dorm by themselves. Yeah. So I, I am a little discombobulated you know, how to go about. Dance is movement. Right. I, I know that uh, in your face-to-face -face class, you you do a lot of modeling uh, of movement and you have the students uh, perform those and you provide immediate feedback and so forth, um, which I'm sure is difficult over Zoom. I, I'm wondering if there is some opportunity um, for uh, for feedback on student movement that is maybe not real time. That is, did you try having students record different um, movements and then post them for for feedback later? Rather I than did. I did, but Keith, it takes two million four hundred and forty four years to, you, five, to play back through all of the videos. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, but you have 25 students, each an individual and something. I am willing to give my time to purchase, but not that amount. Yeah, right. And um, and it wouldn't be shorter. It wouldn't be shorter videos necessarily on the part of individual students, whereas in, in, know, in a classroom. Yeah, you know, go ahead. No, really, you know, dance is coordination. Yep. Dance is musicality. Dance is technique. So, you know, in, in 15 seconds, you don't see it. Right. It has to be at least a minute. That's what we do, combinations, steps yep. put together. So it, it's really, really, to me, it has been a total enigma. I have to say it was very hard to teach on Zoom yeah. before. Not right. hard in terms I could demonstrate, I could do everything, but I didn't see any improvement. I felt a lot of resentments because they couldn't, the kids couldn't. So I don't know yeah. how to go about it. I mean, it's... it's right. It's, it's, and in the, in the studio, you can watch all of the students in mass do a five-minute uh, movement sequence and, and review them all in a five-minute time period. Whereas if each student did a five-minute video, then it multiplies your, your time um, yeah. that immensely. So, yeah, Michelle? Um, I, I, sorry, I had my camera off for most of my time because my kids were yeah. <laughs> cra cra crazy. So it was a childcare thing. Um, but, uh, I agree, Rosanna, I know that it's, it's so difficult to teach, to teach dance. Um, and I was constantly trying to find ways to Please. build the community to continue with like really detailed corrections. One thing that I did find, and you probably already already did it, but when I would see someone who was either doing it really excellent or who needed some additional work, I it, it made my class go a little slower. But I would I would stop and I would either pin that person or I would just say, okay, everyone, look at Angelina. Angelina face profile, left hand on the bar. You know, watch how she does this, or she needs more toes going back. And so, you know, what I would have is like. 30 other students like this, you know, really close to the screen, trying to see this, you know, tiny little foot wrapping around the ankle. But I felt like if I did enough of those kinds of moments throughout an hour and a half or two hour class, people, not that I, you know, want to make someone feel special, but someone felt like 
I'm being seen and the other dancers were building on that community moment. Um, it's still, I totally agree with you, Rosanna. It's super hard. It's hard to feel the musicality because we have a delay. Totally, totally understand. But that was a moment of just like going in and giving really specific and encourage, say like everyone come up to your screen so you can see so-and-so's right knee, you know, so that it, it slowed the class down, but it, it felt like it built a little bit of community. Michelle, I have done that. And it has worked to a point because also once you are, what is happening in dance for the people that are not familiar, you know, you give a correction for everybody, but you can see everybody in class. I have done that. I pinpoint one person, do this, do that. But the other people were yawning because I had the upper class. I have people, I have people three and four. So they want to dance, they want to go. So it was a counterbalance there, you know. But that's what I'm I'm saying to you, Keith. If you yeah. can't come up with some idea with the computer, I my Well, I mean this is this is why most of the dance classes will be face to face this fall, right? Yeah, but the question is uh, uh, again what happens? What happens? My safety. Yeah. And, and you know, and uh, you know, there will be. I don't care about you know hard at work, but I do care about my safety. What the how they control the kids getting in and out of uh, not uh, in and out of the building. Yeah. How? How? They, do you think they're going not to socialize? I doubt it. They are 18, 19, 20, 21. <laughs> they want to socialize. This is clear to me. Yeah. So Larry? I don't know. Just a real quickie, uh, I want to reiterate that I watched Rosanna's class and I watched the Graham class and she did a great job and they really liked what they were doing. And I have to say this about the Zoom classes, it's a pain in the butt for all of us. It's not what we want to do, but what we have to do right now. And those kids, I think, were extremely appreciative of the fact they were getting a class at all. They weren't sitting home watching soap opera. Yeah. You know, so they were moving. It wasn't completely disciplined, we know that. We know what we're dealing with here. And so you can't beat yourself up. You just do what you can do. I think the biggest problem, and it's not the problem, but I liked it, what you uh, submitted about going back and do a checklist for the beginning. I think that was very informative for me. I have to go back and look at that and apply yep. it to my Zoom classes. I'm not gonna teach face-to-face. -face. I refuse to under these circumstances. So if we go back to Zoom, a lot of the information you gave is going to be extremely helpful. First of all, getting to know the students on Zoom, it's a lot harder, of course. Right. It's something I think we have to take the time to figure out how to make that work so they feel like they're really involved in like a Pilates class. Be, be, it can be just pure movement, it can be boring right. as hell. How are you going to make that interesting? You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, the, the dance uh, conservatory is. Uh, such a tight community, do you already know a number of your students that you'll be having in your classes this fall? Yeah, so that helps. Upper, upper class, then, yeah. That helps. You know what was really interesting is that teaching in the springtime, like I already had my kids for a whole semester. So Zooming was very easy because yeah. I had like routine uh, preset exercises. So teaching, if I had to teach Zoom brand new kids who didn't know me, that's going to be a whole different yep. challenge. I teach yep. in a Graham class to somebody who had Graham. Oh my God, what a headache, you know? <laughs> but that's the beauty about ballet too. Most people have a ballet language, you mm -hmm. know, even though it's slightly different. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, some of those old time teachers that sit on a stool would just say what they wanted them to do and they would do it. It's a language. Dance yeah. is language, French yes. language. You know, but a modern, it's a whole different world. You have to demonstrate your own thing. So I, I forget, is there, are there any plans in dance to do uh, kind of a fishbowl uh, approach where you might have one or two students physically in the studio that you're working with in kind of a master class situation? And maybe the other students are watching the master class over Zoom and then you rotate students around. That way you have a more controlled face-to-face -face environment and um and students regularly rotate into that but the other students are uh still 
taking advantage of the master class kind of situation uh, remotely. I don't know. The fact of being remotely or even being in another studio, you know, I had kids that were taking their ballet class in, in a bathroom because that was the yeah. biggest place yeah. in their house. Yeah. In a kitchen where the mother was cooking. It's difficult to concentrate. Yeah, they will be here. They'll be here on campus. Well, the <laughs> fact is that uh, I thought also of having, no, I don't know, kids. I really don't know. I, I thought maybe if you could have a big TV, huge TV, where you can actually project all the students in the huge TV so you can actually see them performing. That gives you scholarship. And, but that requires money, time, and energy. Yeah. They do it with the, with the major companies, with American Ballet Theatre, San Francisco Ballet. They have these huge TVs where they can see the company, the people. And the teacher is outside. But that requires so much energy, money, and time. So you're talking about projecting the, uh, the students from the studio um, yeah. to you at a remote location. Correct. So the students would be office, for students would be face to face with the instructor, not. Yeah. There's a woman the in Texas distant, you know, but amazing. I don't know. But this requires this is too much. I mean, Nell is doing the impossible, you know, to to create an atmosphere mm -hmm. that it, it is collaborative and 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 you know and warm and secure for everybody. But I question if you are 17, 18, 19 years old. You know, you want to socialize. Yep. You want to go out. You know, one evening you say, I had enough. I want to socialize. Bingo. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. Thank you, Keith. This was, yeah. this was great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we have necessarily uh, answers for, for everything know. we're going to be dealing with this fall. And... Um, you know, if we make it through to Thanksgiving, um, well, it'll be an experience one way or the other. 